Hello friends, good afternoon and welcome to Edisad Live Lectures. Dear friends, today in computer sciences we will, we will be talking about radio propagation for wireless communications. To discuss this topic we have with us our subject expert Dr. Adwitya Sinha. Dr. Sinha is assistant professor in department of computer sciences in an eminent university in national capital region. Without further ado, I would like to welcome ma'am to our studios and request her to start the lecture. Welcome ma'am. Thank you. Uh, hello viewers. Today we are going to discuss on the topic uh, radio propagation. That is we will discuss about different impacts that radio propagation has on wireless communication. It's different mechanisms and models. In this lecture, uh, we'll start with an introduction to wireless communication. Then uh, we'll know what actually propagation is in context of wireless radio. We'll discuss about uh, the propagation mechanisms, different attenuations, the radio frequency bands, because uh, obviously we are speaking about uh, wireless radio. So we should know that wireless, uh, in wireless domain, the bandwidth is severely uh, restricted. So we have to use it in a very optimized manner. That's why we divide the radio into different bands and each band is specific to certain applications. So, uh, radio frequency bands is what we will study about. Then, uh, wireless channel characteristics, the path loss models, some benchmark models, some uh, realistic models, and other impediments including uh, fading, interference, Doppler shift, etc. And its impact on energy and coverage issues. Now, what is wireless communication? Or more generically, uh, the question could be, what is wireless? Wireless is uh, something that is uh, free of cables, any dedicated wires or conductors. It allows uh, the transmission of information or in other words, we can say that it uh, provides a viable support to the communication of data to different other wireless enabled devices with the help of electromagnetic waves. The electromagnetic waves include radios, acoustics, or uh, infrared, satellite, etc. But mostly for uh, wireless communication, uh, we prefer the use of uh, radio technology. But in some cases like uh, for underwater wireless communication, what happens? The radio transmission is very poor uh, due to long and variable propagational delays. That's why uh, for such application, sound energy is used for, en uh, for communication of data. Otherwise, uh, radio technologies are mostly uh, useful, are predominantly being used in most of the uh, domains. Next is what are the types, the different types of wireless technologies that are used for uh, imparting communication in this domain. The first is satellite communication. Satellite communication uh, is a very uh, important uh, technology that provides uh, full coverage irrespective of where the person or the device is uh, geographically located. With the uh, better coverage, uh, the cost has to be compensated in this case. Then we have uh, wireless networking technologies, mainly uh, includes Wi-Fi and WiMAX. Wi-Fi is very predominantly used as in our laptops, in tablets, in smartphones, etc. What happens in this technology? There is a short range that is formed and uh, within this range, uh, whoever user comes, they can access the internet with the help of a password for authentication purpose. Now, Wi-Fi has two important uh, aspects. The first is scalability and the second is ease of use. Scalability means as the users come and join the network, there is no problem as uh, there is no restriction on the communication ports available. Since we are talking of wireless, so any number of users can be supported and it can be easily used across any domain. Moreover, uh, the mobile users are also supported 
because what happens in case of Wi-Fi, if uh, there are several locations, say there is a location A and B and a user moves from location A to B and both the locations are Wi-Fi enabled, then as the user moves from uh, location A to B, it leaves the services imparted by A and gains from B. So there is a small disruption of service rather than complete disconnection. However, the only uh, thing is that it's a short range communication and password protection is required. This is also known as wireless uh, LAN, that is wireless local area network. Then we have WiMAX. This technology provides uh, a broadband support, so it's also known as wireless broadband. In this, what happens, uh, it provides a very high speed internet. 4G uh, technology is a variant of WiMAX, but uh, still it is under construction uh, as uh, the technology is not uh, very widespread used these days. Next is wireless energy transfer. This technology transmits or we can say that it first converts the uh, electrical energy into electronic energy so as to uh, enable the wireless devices to get charged without actually using the electrical ports. This is mainly uh, uh, useful for medical purposes as in uh, body area network what happens there are some devices that are implanted inside of a body for measuring certain uh, temperature, body temperature or blood pressure, sugar level etc. Now, in this case, what happens is it's a, it's a type of sensor, a small wireless device. So, it is a battery operated device. It draws its energy from the battery. So, it is quite possible that the battery gets exhausted. So, in that case, the battery needs to be charged. So, if it, it, it's a kind of a wired uh, domain, then it would be very difficult to penetrate through the uh, body of the patient and get it charged. So, here wireless charging for particularly for body area networks are very useful. Then we have Bluetooth technology. Uh, this technology is very much similar to Wi-Fi technology as they provide a short range uh, space for its users and uh, it supports quite a good speed. But the only difference is that Wi-Fi provides uh, a portal to the, its users to connect to the internet. So it, he, the user connected through Wi-Fi can surf any uh, materials on the web at any time. But with uh, Bluetooth what happens only uh, the sharing of files among peers is possible. It's not that they get connected to the internet through Bluetooth but only that a small network is created and they can share their own local files with one another. Then we have Zigbee. This is less a technology and has become more a standard these days. It offers support for uh, low power communication devices and helps them to extend their battery lifetime. Provides a very good data rate and mostly used by sensor networks uh, and other wireless devices. Now since we are talking about wireless devices, what type of uh, electronic devices there could be? Let us see. The first is transistor, it is uh, possibly the oldest and the most basic form of wireless device. These days the upgradation has been performed and we can find uh, the variant of the same in our uh, music systems or uh, even in our phones, uh, car music systems etc. Then we have walkie talkie, though they are very basic they do not need uh, much installation cost. but uh, these have a limited usage on the battlefield scenarios, etc. Then we have uh, wireless phones. Wireless phones are mainly of two types, the cordless phones and cellular phones. Cordless phones are, uh, have a sh very, very short range while cellular phones have larger range because they uh, rely upon better technologies and uh, the telecommunication towers. Then the remote devices, they are very predominantly used again in our daily lives as uh, we operate television or air conditioning or any game systems etc. What we do, we are very habituated of using a remote with us. We do not go uh, to the television set and 
push buttons are not these days available at all. So we are very free with the remotes. So they are a part of the wireless domain. Then we have wireless sensors of course, these are distributed networks that are there with us for uh, performing application based research in various fields. And other devices like uh, video game consoles, baby monitors, etc. they also form um, the examples of wireless devices. Now what are the different wireless data transmissions that are available with us? that makes the transmission feasible. The first is wireless routers. Now these are the electronic devices that takes internet connection as input and provides RF signal to the nearby uh, enabled, uh, the wireless enabled devices so that uh, those devices can access internet through the wireless routers. Now mostly these days uh, whatever uh, wireless devices are available in the market, they have a built-in uh, wireless router facility. But however, uh, it can be uh, uh, installed uh, whenever or uh, whatever required. And also they have uh, security features built into it. Then we have wireless adapters. The wireless adapters are uh, the devices uh, that imparts the ability to connect to internet. So this is uh, uh, what whenever we have an electronic device and we have adapters in it installed, only then our electronic devices are capable of uh, receiving the RF signals transmitted by the routers. Then we have the wireless repeaters. Yes, these repeaters are very important when we want to broaden the range of the routers. See, like uh, wireless routers, they have a small range. Any wireless device, since they are battery operated, they will have a small range. But there is always option to extend their range. Repeaters are one of them. What they do, they take the signal, uh, whatever they have got from a particular uh, RF, the routers, and then they amplify the signal and then again they retransmit it. So this way, a boosted signal strength is uh, generated from the wireless repeaters. Then we have microwave. It operates on a dual uh, mode basis, satellite mode and a terrestrial mode. In, in terrestrial mode, what happens? There are uh, two or more microwave towers that communicate with each other without any hindrances, which is also known as line of sight communication. Now, since there is no hindrances, so the speed will be very high and uh, the data transfer will be very, very secure. So generally used for uh, military services or uh, communication between high authority officials, etc. Finally, we have infrared. This type of transmission is uh, made through LEDs uh, or also known as lasers. This provides even higher uh, speed of data transmission as compared to microwave but they offer short range communication. So we can see that we have different types of transmissions available with us uh, that enables uh, a type of communication which is required according to the application requirements. Now let's see whether uh, the wireless domain is advantageous to uh, such an extent that we can uh, overcome all the difficulties that were there with the cabling system or the wired system. So let's see, the first one is uh, information transmission with high speed technology. Yes, of course, because uh, when wireless came into the picture, uh, the speed was not very good. It was uh, like so less that people used to prefer wired only for uploading and downloading documents. But as the technology upgraded, the speed became incredibly high. So there is an improvement in speed. Also the service improvement has uh, also, uh, it's there with ease of access, both in productivity, also in GUIs, the graphical user interface. Then the remote connection between mobile users uh, or portable workstations is feasible. Uh, particularly when users are moving frequently from one place to another. 
Wireless communication gives us the ability to span larger distances and most of the time what happens uh, there are applications like uh, there is a flood or an earthquake and the whole wired system has went down. So it can act as a backup uh, communication link as well. It supports for users obviously not limited to the number of connection ports as it was the case earlier with uh, wired domain and it incurs less expenses in installation and maintenance. Now we have some advantages obviously there will be some drawbacks also. First is since uh, wireless domain the wireless channel is uh, considered so uh, it is very vulnerable to hacking unless and otherwise some security mechanisms are inbuilt into it that is before we send a packet in the air in the channel it has to be decrypted or uh, 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 there has to be some encryption and decryption facility within the packet so that any hacker if hacks the packet will not get the information that is intended for the destined location. Also it is susceptible to wireless impediments. Now what is wireless impediments? These are the flaws that happens when uh, wireless communication takes place. It includes different propagation mechanisms, uh, fading uh, or other impediments like uh, interference etc. So next we will be talking about all these issues. So now we are in a position when we know that what wireless communication is, what are its significance etc. Now we uh, should know that how this uh, radio wave, the signal that we were talking about uh, it propagates in the air. Now radio propagation is very essential uh, for design and deployment of wireless networks and it is very very site specific. Site specific means that uh, it depends upon the surrounding the environment in which it has to be installed. For example the first is nature of terrain that is if the terrain is very flat, if it is hilly or if it has lots of vegetation, there are lots of hindrances. So this is very important because a flat terrain will give you a complete coverage. Then we have radio frequency of operation, how frequently uh, that in a particular area the users uh, are into wireless communication, this also plays important role. Then whether the users who are into communication uh, whether they are mobile or not, if they are mobile then what is the rate, uh, what are the velocity that is uh, there and also interference sources. If uh, the signal that I am sending will get hindered by some object or other then wh what are those objects that their dimensions etc. Now once we have the site specific observations with us and the channel characteristics along with the propagation uh, models that, that is the mathematical models that are developed that act as benchmark. Together these two the channel characterization and the model what we can do is we can predict the signal coverage. Prediction is very important because uh, the wireless devices are a bit expensive and uh, if we install it and find that the performance is not good it will become very difficult to again upgrade or change the system. So predicting the signal coverage that if we install it in this uh, manner then uh, what type of coverage I am expected to get. So if I know that I can make some prior arrangements. Also what type of data rates uh, we need and what we will actually get. Apart from that analysis of the interference sources and, and this will definitely help us to uh, determine what are the optimized location for uh, positioning our base station antennas, the main uh, antennas, uh, the workstation antennas that are there for uh, providing better management facilities of the internet among users of a closed vicinity. And this will overall improve the reception schemes as well because as uh, already told that in wireless channel what happens uh, there is a very high chance of uh, error or um, in, in the packets getting uh, corrupted. So it is important to add some uh, decryption and encryption technologies into it so that uh, when it goes into the air even if it is uh, like tampered in some extent or other when it reach, reaches the destination 
the destination or the receiver should have such mechanisms to decrypt it back into the original message. So, reception schemes are also required and their performance has to be considerably high. Now, what are the different propagation mechanisms? That is uh, the ways through which the radio, uh, the radio waves propagates, that is the radio wave travels from one medium to another. If these mechanisms are controlled in a manner, then they will help us or they will even boost the signal to reach its uh, location. But if they are not managed properly, they can uh, distort the signal and uh, disturb the communication that is going on between two or more terminals. Now, the first is line of sight propagation. In line of sight propagation, the first assumption is the propagation has to be in free space. That is no hindrances. The transmitter and the receiver stations are uh, in such a, are deployed in such a scenario that is uh, between them there is no hindrances, no obstacles at all. So, what happened in that case? The receiving antenna is above the radio horizon of the transmitting station. Now, what is this radio horizon? As we have uh, in case of humans, we know this uh, term optical horizon. If we are standing in front of a seashore and we see, we will find that the water body, whatever it can be a sea or ocean, it meets the sky and forms a straight line. This straight line is known as optical horizon, that is the capability of human eyes to what extent they can see. Uh, when we are saying radio horizon, it means that to what extent a radio transmitted from a particular transmitter can reach. So, if uh, the receiver is within the radio horizon uh, of the uh, transmitter, then the receiver and the transmitter can communicate with each other flawlessly. So, this may happen uh, when a earth station that is a terrestrial station is communicating with another terrestrial station in a LOS manner or a terrestrial station communicating with a satellite or a satellite with another satellite. In these cases, uh, we have a LOS communication. However, this LOS communication can get hampered um, by uh, other phenomena like scattering, reflection, refraction, etc. that will come across. Now, what is scattering? When the wave travels through a medium and if it hits some object whose dimension is very small as compared to uh, its own wavelength, there is a wavelength of the propagating wave, then what happens that the wave gets scattered into various weaker outgoing signals. That is, it gets uh, distributed into smaller components. Now, these components, uh, obviously their direction gets disturbed and they get uh, a very uh, different, uh, its composition gets changed. Now, this happens when the wave uh, hits some street lamps or uh, some signs or it can be leaves, etc. Now, in the diagram, we can see that uh, as one, one means uh, line of sight propagation. In line of sight propagation, we can see that it is happening between two uh, satellites, SA and SB. It is feasible between station, Earth station A uh, and satellite SA or between A and B, both are Earth stations. And scattering happens at, uh, it is shown by arrow 2. We can see that uh, though it reaches, reaches to its location, but its uh, strength is weakened and other components are there that gets lost into the environment. Now, third is reflection. Reflection happens when the radio wave hits an object uh, that is whose dimension is quite large with respect to its own wavelength. So, in that uh, case what happens? The wave does not get scattered, but rather it bends. This bending causes a phase shift of 180 degrees. Next is ground wave propagation. Ground wave propagation mostly happens due to magnetic properties or electrical properties of earth uh, or ocean currents, etc. What uh, uh, happens is that ground wave uh, propagated wave, they tend to bend with the curvature of the earth. In the diagram, we can see that fourth 
shows the fourth arrow shows uh, ground wave propagation. Next very important is diffraction. Diffraction happens uh, when it hits with an object of almost of its own size, but the composition of the object is such that the rays cannot pass through the, uh, through the walls of that object. So instead what happens the wave tends to bend at the edges of the object. So we can see in the diagram as uh, by arrow 5. What happens here also there is a little scattering, but uh, scattering is what uh, there is a uniform sp uh, splitting of the original traveling wave into different components. But here what happens major uh, the ma majority of the wave gets bent at the edge of the uh, object while a very few amount of its strength gets scattered. Now obviously it is a frequency dependent phenomena, lower frequency waves tend to diffract more. Next is refraction. Refraction is a phenomena that occurs when uh, the propagating wave hits a penetrable object that is now the object can be passed through. But what happens its optical density is different than its own as a result of which the direction changes and reduction in uh, wavelength is observed. So these are the six uh, impediments or uh, we can say if we control it properly then it can help radio propagation. Thank you. Welcome back. We will start uh, in this session about tropospheric attenuation. Now troposphere is the lowest level of atmosphere as atmosphere has different layers ionosphere, exosphere, etc. So troposphere is that layer in which most of the weather phenomena takes place. It is highly dynamic and inhomogeneous. Inhomogeneous means that uh, the composition uh, has many gaseous uh, substances in it along with some uh, chemicals are also there these days pollution is so high so we fi find uh, pollutant particles etc. So in the troposphere what happens the radio waves tend to attenuate, scatter, refract and also it can reflect back. The polarization of waves also takes place. Since we have um, charged electron particles on the uh, in the atmosphere so it, it it is a, there is a quite uh, possibility that the propagating wave, the strength of the propagating wave may fluctuate, fluctuate in the sense that it may get overcharged, signal strength can increase or it can uh, get uh, like uh, its charge can also get diminished due to uh, scattering and refraction etc. So there is a fluctuation in the signal strength level. Also this imparts a noise into the uh, propagate, propagating signal. Now attenuation due to atmospheric absorption can be again divided into two parts. First is due to clear air and the second is due to precipitation and fog. As we have uh, seen uh, often observed 
that uh, in, a, in case there is a thunderstorm or uh, we have a very cloudy weather, what happens? The signals are not clear. It happens due to attenuation in the troposphere. Now, these are the frequency bands that are available for wireless radio for different applications. So, we can see that for marine communication, uh, two types of bands are available, very low frequency and low frequency according to the requirements, uh, these can be adopted. Similarly, AM broadcasting, FM broadcasting, uh, cellular telephone, satellite telephone, etc. The, we can see that in the table, the highest frequency uh, that is uh, there is with visible light that is used for optical communication. So, for different application demands, we have a different frequency band. This helps in managing the wireless radio in an efficient manner. Now, next is wireless channel characteristics. Now, so far we can make out that wireless channel is susceptible to a variety of transmission impediments and these are particularly uh, path loss due to scattering, refraction and other propagation mechanisms. It can be fading, uh, interference, etc. Now, these factors uh, what happens? They restrict greatly the range of the radio propagation. That is by default to whatever range a radio has the ability to propagate, its, its capability is severely diminished. What else? The data rate and the reliability of wireless transmission also gets hampered. And the extent to which these factors affect the transmission again depends upon the environmental that is the closed vicinity, what, what are the conditions uh, around that uh, particular uh, wireless devices takes uh, into consideration as well as the mobility of transmitter and the receiving devices. Now, a transmitted signal has two components. The first is the LOS component that is goes directly from the uh, transmitter to the receiver and there is a chance that it can get deflected. That is, it can be any one of the uh, five propagation mechanisms, the first being LOS. So, this, these are known as multipath components. A ray that is transmitted can get uh, diffracted and uh, get reported to the destination or it can get scattered and report to the destination. So, we can get a, a number of uh, versions of the same uh, signal that is being originally transmitted. Now, we need some models to predict the path loss or uh, in other words what we can say that we need some uh, model for uh, forecasting that what type of power level is required at the receiver side so that they can receive the transmitted signal flawlessly. So, what a path loss model exactly does is it relates the loss of signal strength to the, to the distance between the terminals. Terminals in this case are the transmitter and the receiving stations. So, uh, the path loss is what? It is basically a function of the TR separation distance, the transmitter and the receiver separation distance. In other words, uh, we can say that it is a ratio of the function of transmitted signal to the received signal. When we use the path loss models, what actually the radio engineers tend to calculate? They calculate the coverage area of the wireless stations, the wireless base stations or sinks and the terminals which are also known as access points. The maximum distance between two terminals in an ad hoc network can also be predetermined with the use of these path loss models. So, these are a kind of prediction models that help the radio engineers to do some analytic part before actually uh, practically implementing the wireless environment. Now, the path loss models differ uh, due to certain dynamism of surroundings. So, uh, it is not like that we have a certain uh, set of uh, path loss models available with us. We can always create some hybridization over them. So, according to whatever the uh, environment is, whatever the constraints are with the radio engineers, they play an important role to select what type of path loss models uh, we will take. The first is free space model uh, that considers LOS communication, then two ray model, 
This is another uh, which takes into consideration the LOS path along with exactly one reflected path. So free space, two ray and log distance model, these are all benchmark models. That is, they are not directly used to the environment uh, to model real world scenarios, but yes, they form a strong basis for others, other model to develop. Then there are other models like log normal, Okumura, Hata model. These models are used for city based models, cities that are uh, very crowded or there are, that are not much crowded uh, on the hilly areas or whatever. Uh, Ikegami model is another very important uh, one for uh, town and city based versions. Now let us start with the first one that is a free space propagation model. Now what happens in this model this is a very simplest one and we assume that we have a direct path between the transmitter and the receiver without any hindrance. So there is uh, whenever a signal is transmitted we assume that ideally that signal transmits from the transmitter and flawlessly received by the receiving station. This generally does not happen but we are taking ideal situations so that uh, we can analyze the ideal behavior if this happens then ideally what, if, what the cases will be. Also we assume that there is no atmospheric attenuation that, that is the atmospheric hindrances uh, do not play any part and there are no multipath component that is the signal is only transmitting uh, through a single path there are no multiple paths in the communication. Also the antenna that is used for uh, the communication purpose is taken to be isotropic. Isotropic means that this type of antenna radiates uh, the signal power uniformly in all directions. Now let us take up this image. Uh, we can see that we have a circle uh, with a radius r. Now this uh, basically models an antenna whose coverage uh, or the, the coverage radius is given by the small r and it is uh, centered at the uh, center of the circle. Now the transmitting antenna is located at the center and its density is given by ratio of the effective radiated power that is Pt upon the surface area of the sphere which is well known to be 4 pi r square. So this is our total power density on the sphere. Power density means if the antenna uh, having the coverage radius as r is activated then what area will get affected and with what strength of power. Then as a path loss model is considered uh, what we intend to get from a path loss model is the prediction of the receiver power that is if uh, this uh, transmitter sends this type of signal then uh, what the receiver uh, station should what type of uh, power level the receiver station should maintain so as to catch the signal in a proper manner. So this can be found out as a product of the power density that is we have calculated in uh, equation 1 PD and the effective aperture of the receiving antenna. The, this area can be given as uh, lambda square g by 4 pi. We are not going into the proof of this, we can just directly use it. And when we put uh, all these values and plug it into the equation 2, uh, we get the received power level as in equation 3. So this gives us exactly what level of power has to be maintained by the receiving end. Now if we uh, take up this study a little uh, deeper, we can also find out the path loss. We can also uh, get a prediction, a kind of estimation for what is the path loss that we get. Now this uh, path loss can be given as uh, it is uh, uh, theoretically as we have already told, it is a ratio of PT and PR. But since we are concerned about low power systems, that is the sensor systems, uh, that, that are very very uh, they work on a very low power systems uh, some milliwatts. So what we will do we will take it in form of decibels 
and when we talk of decibels, we can convert any value, any fraction into decibel by just using 10 log to the base 10. So we have used the same funda over here and you can see that uh, in equation 4, we get the prediction for power, uh, path loss in case of free space model. Now the second model is two ray propagation model. So far we were concerned about uh, uh, what if uh, there is only one uh, line of propagation and the wave is not getting uh, deflected anyhow. But now we are considering that if there is one exactly one component that is getting either reflected or refracted or whatever, but it is coming through a different path. In that case what happens? Let us see. Here uh, the received signal is generally given by the formula as in 5, equation number 5, uh, though it is not very necessary to go into depth just to know that it is a cosine component and the first is uh, given for a direct wave that is the LOS part and the second shows the ground reflected part. Assumptions that we make is that uh, the heights of the antenna has to be large enough than the wavelength of the propagating wave and the ground waves, the effect of ground waves are uh, should be absent. Since the height of the antennas are too high, so the curvature, odds curvature is almost lacking. So with this assumptions, what we can do is, we can build this uh, small geometry. So we can see over here that HT and HR are the antenna heights of transmitter and receiver. Here what happens, DD is the direct component and DR is a reflected, reflected component. So here we apply very simple trigonometry and we get that if we want to calculate DD, then what happens? Uh, we take a simple geometry over here. As you can see that this is, this is a simple Pythagoras formula. Uh, since we have intended to find DD, what we are doing, with, we are taking the square of HT minus HR and the square of R and we are doing a square root function. So likewise we can find out the direct component and the reflected component. Once we have both the components, uh, we can just uh, approximate it using Taylor's expansion and do a simple calculation to find out the difference between the reflected and the direct component, which comes out as an equation uh, 11 as a product of the antenna heights and as a function of the R. Now what happens? We are also uh, interested to know the time delay. That is obviously when there are two components, the directed component and the reflected component. So obviously when the reflected component reaches the uh, transmit, uh, the receiver, what happens? There is some time delay. So how to find the time delay? Uh, it's a very basic calculation. The time is what it is distance upon speed. And in this case, speed, speed will be what? Speed is nothing but velocity of light. So in this manner, we find out the time delay. And also we can calculate uh, omega that is angular velocity. And finally, whatever we have done calculation in equation 6, just plug in the values in it and we get the power uh, that is required to be maintained at the receiving end if it is following a two-ray propagation model. And the path loss is given by as in equation 21. And remember that these are in decibels because we are dealing with very low power systems. Now we have log distance models. Log distance uh, models are predominantly used in cases uh, where accuracy is required but computational complexity has to be kept low. Again path loss can be found out in the similar manner that is PT by PR and we can see this in equation 23. This way there are so many models available, the log models, uh, the distance models, etc. and it is up to the radio engineers to deploy which model uh, exactly as it is or uh, some hybridization can be used. Now let us come to fading. Fading is a 
uh, very important transmission impediment uh, that happens and th that often happens and it results in fluctuation of the signal strength as it receive, uh, uh, received by the destination. This can be of two variants, fast fading and slow fading. Now, what is fast fading? Fast fading uh, refers to the rapid fluctuations in uh, amplitude, phase or multipath delays of received signal. That is, we have already discussed that whenever a signal travels, it not only travels through the LOS, it can also travel through different paths. And when it travels through different paths, different versions are created of the same uh, source of the signal same uh, signal gets replicated into different versions and these versions since they uh, follow different paths they arrive at the destination at different time. So, if we keep track of the time from uh, a particular uh, when the first version the first copy was received and the time period till the last was received then this duration is known as delay spread. Now, due to interference what happens the, uh, between uh, these multiple versions there are certain error factors that get introduced. Now which may uh, affect constructively and obviously it can often uh, be destructive at the receiver end. Now the received uh, signal envelope that is received why it is called envelope because we are having a number of uh, versions with us of the same signal. So, in this case what, what we need, we need some distributions to uh, simulate the behavior of the uh, waves. So, here we have Rayleigh distribution if there is no line of sight available. If there is a line of sight available for example, uh, in indoor settings for office environments, for home uh, applications etc., then Ricean distribution is preferred. The other variant is slow fading. Slow fading occurs when uh, the signal is like fully or uh, to some extent uh, gets absorbed by some hindrances. But the thing is this type of ob obstacles may be there for some time or uh, it is like it might be mobile, it is not like the behavior is dynamic of such obstacles. So, this duration of fade that may uh, last for some seconds or minutes or whatever time period, uh, they affect in a very uh, poor in a very poor manner that is the slow fading may occur when the receiver is temporarily shielded from the transmitter this type of obstruction often creates random variation in the uh, level of the signal strength also this is known as shadow fading now just to summarize uh, shadow fading what it does it obviously it hampers the performance uh, of the received signal and this can be uh, alleviated with the use of fade margins as a mitigation popular mitigation technique that is uh, done uh, or increase the transmission power level etc. And fast fading that hampers the performance by introducing bit error rates or packet error rates uh, because multiple versions are being received. So, which version to choose and uh, which to uh, not. So, it depends upon again the engineering factor. So, uh, this can be mitigated with the help of certain error control mechanisms. Uh, if we have proper error control mechanisms at the receiving end, we can obviously take a summarization or aggregation of uh, the multiple versions of the packets being received or we can uh, use directional antennas, antenna arrays or some modulation technique so as to uh, eradicate the effects of shadow and fast fading. Next is interference. Now, interference is what uh, to understand this we have to also uh, we should know that uh, the transmitted signal when a, whenever a signal is transmitted it is on the air then there are some distortions added into it and also some unwanted signals that is distortion of the already traveling signal and some more added noise. So, this noise is known as interference, the distortion along with the unwanted components that are being added. Now, interference 
it uh, obviously it hampers the system performance, the wireless system performance. And there are three basic forms of interference, adjacent channel interference, co-interference and inter-symbol interference. Now let us see the features. What happens in uh, adjacent channel interference is that whenever there is a ongoing communication in a particular channel then the adjacent channel frequencies if they interfere with it then what we get we get an adjacent channel interference. So and how to alleviate this how to combat it with the help of GERD bands. If uh, between two adjacent uh, ongoing communication there is a GERD band which is also a frequency band actually uh, put between or sandwiched between the two ongoing uh, communication then what it does whenever there is a overlapping the overlapping will not be uh, with each other rather it will move or it will have its impact on the GERD band. Next is co-channel interference. In co-channel interference uh, some nearby systems it can be AM systems, marine systems or FM systems any systems uh, if they are using the same frequency then there is a 100% chance that interference will take place and this can be combated using frequency reuse. What happens in frequency reuse is that uh, the same frequency is not uh, made to use in the nearby vicinity. This is uh, very much available in cellular technology, cellular arrangement of uh, antennas etc. Third we have intersymbol interference. This is closely related uh, with uh, delay spread and that is uh, fast fading uh, as if the delay spread is very small if the uh, duration of the uh, versions of the copy that we are receiving if this duration is kept intendedly very small then it becomes very difficult for the radio engineers at the receiving end to detect correctly the symbols that are being actually transmitted. So we have to optimize that what should be the length of the delay spread. This can be uh, again um, uh, removed with the help of uh, complicated techniques like uh, adaptive equalization etc. Now we have Doppler shift. Now what is Doppler shift? This mainly uh, what it does is uh, the as a frequency change or uh, there is a phase shift in the received signal or if the transmitter and the uh, receiver are mobile with respect to each other then there is an impediment the phenomena that happens and which is this is known as Doppler shift. If uh, the two terminals two or more the communicating terminals are moving towards each other then the frequency of the received signal will be higher than the transmitted signal and if they are moving apart the case is vice versa, uh, frequency will be lower at the term transmitter part. Doppler shift is normally given by the formula uh, which is uh, V by lambda. V is what? It is a relative velocity. Remember it is not the actual velocity, it is a relative velocity between T and R uh, which is obviously a function of the TR separation distance and uh, lambda is the wavelength of the propagating wave. Now whatever we have studied so far they uh, have some impact over the energy and the coverage. Now let us use a very uh, simple energy model uh, using uh, or having the impact of radio propagation on it. Transmitter we know the transmitter uh, dissipates energy to run particularly the radio electronics and the power electronics that is the uh, the radio electronics that with what power I have to transmit the transmitter uh, that should be a known one factor. The second factor is whether there is a requirement for amplification or not. That is if our uh, receiver is quite a distance apart then we need to amplify it. So such transmitters should have uh, such equipped uh, capabilities that it can amplify the signal before transmitting it. And the receiver uh, unit what it does it dissipates energy to run the radio electronics alone. It is not concerned about the amplification part. It will receive whatever strength uh, of uh, signal it is being intended to receive. Now 
Now the power control can be used by appropriately um, setting the power amplifier obviously and it is distance dependent. So if we take some threshold distance say D0 in this case then if whatever the distance uh, obviously it keeps uh, varying uh, with respect to time if this distance is less than threshold distance then we uh, prefer applying the free space model that we studied just now and in other case we apply the two ray model because uh, there is a chance that multipath propagation can take place. Mathematically uh, speaking, the transmission energy is a uh, summation of both the electronics part and the amplifier part. So let us see, as an equation 33, you can see that uh, ETX is what? It is uh, a combination of both the electrical part, E elec is what? E elec is radio electronics energy. By default, there are some values given to electronics energy, amplifier energy uh, for um, LOS that is free space and for multipath. So, these are the standard values that we have. So, uh, with the help of these values and if we know the uh, bit size of the packet that we are sending, we can easily find out the what type of transmission energy is being uh, consumed. Similarly, for uh, reception energy, uh, we can uh, calculate it according to equation 34. Now comes the area coverage computation. Through this computation, a person can, the radio engineers particularly, can predict that what uh, type of coverage is uh, imparted as a result of if a particular uh, wireless domain is being set up. So here we, uh, what we, how to achieve, uh, approach this type of problem is we calculate the probability that uh, the local average received power uh, for distance d, obviously above some threshold y. Now uh, we have, we already know that uh, from equation 36, this is already we have done according to free space uh, path loss. When we have this value and we uh, plug in to uh, equation 35, what we get is equation 38 that gives a uh, standardization of what type of coverage can be achieved. Moreover, we can also uh, do a further, little further calculation if we uh, say that there is an antenna with certain coverage area and the coverage area is uh, assumed to be a circle. So, if a vehicle uh, that is any moving object uh, moves uh, the worst case it is say moving at the circumference then what type of coverage it will get. So, if we have the probability with us and then as an equation 40 what we can do is we integrate it with respect to the radius and the uh, uh, whatever the angle is that is a two dimensional uh, integration can be done to find out the average of uh, the fraction of useful service area. Thank you. On that note, I would like to thank ma'am for this very enriching discussion and thank you dear friends for watching our show. Stay tuned and keep watching. Thank you.